Uh, my name is Carl Smith, and uh, I'm one of the instigators of this talk. And I put it that way because it is uh, an instigation. It's not just about us, it's about a wider context. Um, my previous roles include Global Head of User Experience at Accenture. Um, I was also the Global Head of Design at Wipro Digital. I'm currently um, Chairman of the User Centered Design Society of the United Kingdom, and I'm also CEO of Paradigm Interactions, which is a consultancy that focuses on solving the actual problems of businesses rather than focusing on symptoms and having to constantly return and fix them over and over again. Sorry. And I'm Tom Hesler. Um, well, anyway, it doesn't correct me that, but um, I'm a user experience architect uh, and a researcher. Um, I have done research into how users form mental models of uh, invisible systems, so different models. And um, I'm also um, do consultancy um, work. Uh, I lecture at universities on uh, UX issues and. Uh, at the moment, um, I'm working with uh, Chelsea Apps Factory and KPMG. Um, I'm also a musician as well. Okay, so um, getting to the crux of it. Um, at the uh, Mobile World Congress last year um, in Barcelona, I saw something that really startled me. Now, as my job is usually finding the problem, I wasn't looking for one, but I found one anyway. And what I saw was an in-car infotainment system. They're going to be all over the world, everyone's going to be using them. But I saw an issue that no one else seemed to be talking about. And I'm just going to talk you through a scenario of use here rather than just talking about the issue. I'm driving my car, the car advises me I'm running low on fuel. So now I'm being advised by the car where I can get fuel. This is no longer a passive engagement from the car. The car has got a built-in ability to advise me how to overcome my problems. But it also has the ability to transact for me, which is a really useful capability. However, in doing so, we run into a number of problems. In that first interaction, I'm accessing a number of different cognitive processes. My attention is being drawn to the issue, which is I'm about to run out of gas. That means I'm going to be stuck in the middle of town. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of my situation in terms of consciousness. I've made some decision about what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to respond and go and follow um, the, the, the map I've been given. I'm learning how to overcome in that immediate scenario and I'm accessing uh, my memory, trying to understand what I'm seeing and how it relates to my current scenario. I'm utilizing language to follow signage, and also my emotions are up because I'm thinking I'm gonna get stuck. But on the way, because it's on the way, I've already thought about things that I need to accomplish that day, I've decided to go into my bank, which is a drive through so no problem, I'm gonna pay a bill. And in paying that bill, I access another set of processes. Attention, decision-making, learning, memory, language, and emotions again. Now they're very similar, but they are a change. They are a different set of patterns. Now it's getting near lunchtime, and I normally get something to eat at lunchtime, so the cars advise me I'm near my favorite pizzeria. Now I can get my pizza, and as I'm driving away from the, the bank and heading towards the petrol station, I go past my favorite pizzeria. And in a lot of ways, you can look at this as the new version of coupons. And instead of having coupons thrown at you through various systems, you're actually getting them delivered at the point when you need them. So I'm now looking at uh, a pizza, but actually I like it with extra cheese and extra pepperoni. So I'm now thinking about it in a bit, bit of detail. And what I'm doing is I've accessed another part of process, which is change minds, because actually now I'm I'm very much focused on, I need extra cheese, I need extra pepperoni, and these, these are my desires being met. Unfortunately, there are other people in the world. Now I should say uh, with this image, this is a stock image, it's not a real accident, but the awareness of that change is not part of my 
uh, current mental model because I'm now focused on my stomach instead of focused on driving. So these are the, the kinds of cognitive processes that are then at play. I've had an accident, someone has been hurt. I'm now accessing all my tension, uh, my consciousness, my decision making is coming into play because I'm thinking about what I could have done, how I could have done it differently, how I will respond to the police. All of those things are now uh, at the fore, but also I've got something extra, I've got social cognition. There is a price to pay in our society for our behaviour. So, as we've gone through that scenario, we started with a simple, I need to get petrol, to I need to pay a bill, to I need to have something to eat, to unfortunately a bad scenario where someone is now hurt. So what Carl is saying here basically is, although that's an extreme example, there, we think there's a problem in the Internet of Things, or the growing Internet of Things, that hasn't yet been addressed. Now, we're in early days for obvious reasons, but I think we need to think about it now. And this is that what you have is two very different interaction modes within a new digital ecosystem. So on one hand, as Carl was saying, we have the use of wishes, um, pizza, petrol. And on the other hand, you've got machine behavior, which is triggered by rules. So as Carl says, when uh, the car drives past a certain piece of place, a message is sent. And this is a rule triggered, as the uh, uh, car, the uh, system knows that the car likes pizza, and he's gone past the pizza real. So this basically is what we call a cognition clash in the internet of things. And it's essentially we think because, as usual, the development of technology is superseding considerations of the user. If we go back to the early days of the web, this was the case, that user experience, um, architecture and design grew out of the need to basically fix problems that happened before, almost retrospectively, uh, has now become a, a design discipline itself. And I was actually looking at a book the other day, uh, The Internet of uh, Things um, and, and Business, and it was full of stuff around um, opportunities for business, how we can use it for site-specific marketing, um, automated cars, banking on the move. I had lots of stuff about how developers can implement this stuff, but not one mention in over 200 pages of the user. The person who is centered in this system. And as UX practitioners, we feel that we really need, at this moment, on a very young developing technology to place the user right in the center of this. And so this is what this talk is essentially about. It's thinking about how we do this. It's early days. We're talking about the Internet of Things, which is a distributed computing system, an overlay on the real, as it were, which has no necessary interface. And so we have to think about how do users for useful mental models in order to use what is essentially a visible system. We also need to think about issues around how they appropriate this technology within their own practice. So, basically, and I apologize to all the UX people here at the moment, we need to go back to basics. What I want to do is to think about how mental models can build up into what we call cognitive patterns, and then into what Hutchins calls distributed con uh, uh, cognition and Dowrish in body interaction, and ideas of um, appropriation. So first off, and again, I apologize to everyone who's a US here who will know this, let's define what a mental model is. So actually a mental model is a kind of internal symbol or representation of external reality. And Kenneth Craig suggested in 1943 that the mind constructs small-scale models of reality that it uses 
to anticipate events. So we have a whole load of pictures here. So we have shoes, the mental model of the shoe is that it, um, it goes on my foot, I tie it from not wearing uh, loafers, which I am today, and I can walk around with it. The mental model of a carton is that it holds juice. I open it, or some kind of liquid, to drink from it. The mental model of an egg is that if I crack it, then food stuff that I want will come out. Each of these things are a kind of external representation of their use, which I internalize to understand and predict what I can do. And the internalization of a mental model is a very personal thing. So from an external representation or external thing that I've internalized, we have three flowers. One of them's mine, left. Carl's is the middle. Yours could be the end one. Each of these have the basic same shape of a flower, and we agree on that. But my experience of a flower will be different to Carl's and to yours. My emotions and feelings come into play around a flower. My cognitive process in terms of how I see, how I smell, will come into play as well. So my mental model of a flower, although ostensibly similar because we can agree on what a flower looks like, will still be my personal mental model, which will be different to Carl's or yours. And then we have normal humanity creating their own mental models completely with no points of reference to anything that you would recognize because they're cultural, they're part of their society, part of what they're into. Those things change and create new models that you have never seen before and you may never unless you engage in that society. This is a critical piece. It's not simply about we all think. We all think differently and we think differently by our experiences, what we've learned, how we've learned it, who we've learned it with and what we were trying to achieve while learning. But a mental model, as we've just defined, is a small part of reality. In order to complete a task, we have to join these mental models together into a kind of what we call a cognitive pattern, but what other user experience people might call uh, a task flow. Whatever. But with, for this particular event, we call it a cognitive pattern. And this is a cognitive pattern is a connected collection of mental models um, that form the steps to realize a task. Like plucking a string on a guitar. I have a mental model of my plectrum, which is used to click. I have a mental model of my finger holding down a string. And I have a mental model of a string, and it makes a noise when I click to vibrate. Similarly, if I'm driving a car and I need to brake, the cognitive pattern here is that I know that if I put my foot on the pedal, the wheels, which are going round, will stop. So again, I have a small narrative, a small story, which I can tell myself about breaking. And again, in cooking, I know that if I break the egg, food stuff will come out. I know that if I apply a whisk to it, it will spin, mixing up the egg. And I know that if it's in a bowl, it will hold it in. So it won't go all over the place. So I have my mental models grouped together in order to create a task. And here I am playing my guitar. So people combine cognitive patterns in larger groups to perform complex tasks. So that was a complex task. Plucking a string is a fairly simple task, and it involved three mental models, the string, the plectrum, and my hand. Playing the guitar includes a lot more. It includes six strings, how those six strings will work together, um, how pulling my plectrum across the six strings will work, how holding my hand in a chord will work. All of these mental models go together. Um, so 
people can buy in concrete cats to perform complex tasks. So in order to achieve their goals, what we call a cognitive group. So again, playing a guitar, driving a car, <coughs> and cooking food. I have to interject because Tom doesn't drive. So we'll driving a car uh, is, is all about um, mixing multiple cognitive patterns. We are in fact engaging with truly complex behavior. We, are, we have situational awareness, we are aware of people around us. I remember someone saying to me once, I like you driving Carl because you're not thinking about what is about to happen, you're thinking about what might happen further up the road. And my cognitive pattern is all about awareness, not just in the instance, but also the potentialities. And really good drivers think that way. Sorry, I just said I'm really good driver. Anyway, um, but then it's also the mechanics, the ergonomics of utilizing uh, the various components of the car, the steering wheel, uh, the brakes, the change in the gear, uh, and then uh, whatever else is going on in the car, if you're with your family, with your friends, all of those things are complex patterns that we meld together in milliseconds. Um, and we are, we are quite good at it. But what we are talking about here is, is adding in new sets of patterns that no one knows what they are or how they will affect the existing sets of patterns. Bring in another issue. So what Carl is actually talking about is a good example of what Hutchins calls distributed cognition, which is that Hutchins studied, um, for those who don't know the book Cognition in the Wild, uh, Hutchins studied groups of people trying, using technology to try and create do complex tasks like um, air traffic controllers, people on the brig of a ship, and he discovered that cognition is not just in the head. We have the whole brain in a jar model. is um, not the only thing. That we actually spread our cognition across people, objects, and things. A simple example of this is that if you think about doing a math problem, um, this is a classic example, um, I have an internal representation of the problem. But I may then talk to Carl, who has his own internal representation of the problem, and he will give me his external representation. So now, the cognition, rather than just being my head, is now a shared thing. So the cognition, the task based on the cognition, is my internal and Carl's external. Similarly, I may then start writing on a piece of paper uh, the uh, formula and my workings out. So the cognition space has now become my internal representation versus the, with, sorry, with the, internal, the external representations of the math problem on a piece of paper. So this will become part of the task cognition space. So distribution, distributed cognition studies the way that memories, facts, and knowledge is embedded in the objects, individuals, and tools in the environment. And from this, we have Another study, which I think is of interest here, which is Dowrish's work, Paul Dowrish's work around embodied interaction, which is taking the idea of distributed cognition and looking at how people use technology in their own workspaces. And he found that people tend to interact in an embodied way. We don't just think of our minds, we act, interact bodily, we're non-rational, and uh, we're intersubjective and we're bodily active. So basically users, not designers, uh, create and communicate meaning and manage couplings of that meaning with the technology they're using. So Darish essentially is interested in practice, what they mean by what they do and how that is meaningful to them. And he posits that through practice, people appropriate um, the meanings of their technology and bring them in to their personal narratives and their personal uh, practice. And in bringing to their personal practice, they come to understand it. 
I'm just going to say it, it may seem really dry what we're saying, but we have to underpin it with, with real science here. It's not an opinion. This is not our opinion. This is what we found from science. And actually, we're challenging, we're here to challenge people who are involved in IoT to really look at what you're doing. It's really important. So, with appropriation, in order to understand a cognitive pattern, the user must be able to appropriate this in to their own personal narratives. They should be able to tell a story about how to do this to themselves. This will happen to them uh, to establish their cognitive group. So, playing the guitar, I want to play guitar, I'll first of all probably watch other guitarists. I like guitar players, therefore I've wanted to play a guitar. I may pick up a guitar, which tells me how to play it, or how to hold it. I may start playing around with it to create sound. I might listen to the sound created, um, listen to other guitarists, and ask an expert to teach me, and read musical, learn to read musical notation while I'm playing. All of these things will help to appropriate this into my daily practice. I will understand it because of the narrative. The reason I couldn't talk about the driving is that although I see people drive all the time, I've been driven around, I've watched driving on films, I don't drive. Therefore, I've never appropriated the practice of driving, and so it doesn't mean anything to me. So it's difficult for me to explain how to drive to you. To you. Whereas Carl, who drives a lot, understands and can explain it. So just picking up on the same model, um, appropriating driving is a lot about how we first start to learn about it. We learn about it uh, often with friends, with, with toys, with games. Um, we learn about it while sitting in the back seats and hearing our parents argue all the way somewhere that we didn't want to hear that argument. Or in fact, by sitting in the back seat and having to fight with your sibling, um, learning how your parents deal with the warfare, warfare that's going on in the back seat. Um, we learn about it through actually acquiring the skills, being taught by someone else or by watching someone else. And this always opens up uh, great opportunities to go places that we wouldn't otherwise have got, like this place in Perthshire called Dull, uh, apparently uh, paired with a place in Oregon called Bory. I think there is another one uh, as well, but uh, I'll leave them alone. So cognition is the essential component to understand how the mind works. How people understand what they do is embedded in how they have learned to do things in the patterns they have created. Now, in our experiences of the digital world, we have uh, what Microsoft did with files and folders and filing cabinets, the appropriation of an office system into uh, a digital system, we understood how it would work. It's the same with e-commerce, we understand what a basket is, because we understand what commerce is in terms of going to the shops. So when we see the icon for a basket, we recognize what it means to us. Similarly, in social occasions, when your team scores a try uh, or a touchdown, then you recognize the kind of behaviors that are acceptable with your friends and the excitement you have with your team. However, there are divergent behaviors. And the most common one um, is actually to do with communications. And this is, this is a story that's happened, that's happened a lot uh, over the years, is that different people have appropriated what laugh out uh, LOL means. In, in most people that utilize LOL, they understand it means laugh out loud. However, there is a generational thing that thinks it means lots of love. And this example shows how someone has contacted all of their friends and family about the death of the family and put LOL at the end. Obviously, a quite horrifying text to receive, uh, and even worse to find out that you've put a double meaning into your communication. So, the way the web has managed these kinds of things is to create guided interactions. It's essentially the web uh, has the same kinds of technologies as the IoT, but it's all hidden. And what we've done is we've created something called guided interaction. We've created a presentation where, where people can absorb how something works. Um, we have shopping baskets, we have a buy now. However, all of that furniture, unless it's appropriately placed is meaningless to us. 
but it has to have a logical progression of ideas, otherwise we won't interact with it correctly. And this story is uh, from a, a UX person called Jared Spool. Um, and he was contacted by a major e-commerce company in the US. Jared, we've got a problem. We don't know why, but we're getting a huge number of people coming to our sites and they're not buying anything. Tell us what the answer is. And being a very smart person, he said, I can't tell you what the answer is. I'll find out from the people trying to use your system what the problem is. So he did some user testing. And what he found was a button incorrectly labeled and positioned over two pieces of text causing people to lose their way. And in terms of guiding people in their interactions, they had failed. They had all the right furniture, the buttons and the text and everything, but it was in the wrong locations. He moved that and within a year they made an extra $300 million. That is critical. It's about guiding people. The same as we, the same as the issues that we have with the IoT, we need to guide people how they're going to interact with these kinds of technologies. So the IoT, the Internet of Things, is different from the web at the moment because what we have now is essentially an environment that's set for us, a distributed computer device. The whole environment works as a computer. So what you have is the black box of the computer which holds thousands of processes, millions of processes going the whole time. But the user, all the user ever knows about this is that they press a buy now button. Have now been opened up and put across the environment. And to complicate matters further, it's in the process of becoming, it's not something that is static that is set. As soon as a new device or service is plugged into it, the environment changes, the digital ecosystem that is the Internet of Things changes and is changing constantly. It's an ad hoc combination of unconnected technologies trying to create their own unconnected ecosystems. So the problem here is, as there is no visual interface, how does the user create useful mental models, cognitive patterns, and cognitive groups from essentially what is an invisible system? So there's no standard of interactivity for humans. And, and this is, of course, not a problem if all of the services and devices were passive. So if, as at the moment, all of it within a computer, all of the machine services were just talking to each other to say regulate heating um, or things that really don't affect us that much, then that's not a problem. The problem comes in when, as Carl pointed out, with um, alerts being sent to your car when you're driving around pizzas, that the machines, because of their rule base, start interacting with you in an unexpected way. So, basically, how does a user form cognitive patterns with all this unexpected noise? How do they appropriate this into their daily lives when there's no external representation for them to work with, their internal representation, to create this new mental model, cognitive pattern, cognitive grouping. So the detailed component view that we're used to from the web, pressing buttons, clicking navigation, selecting things, has gone. And these daily interactions within the Internet of Things is no longer valid. So, Cognition Clash, why we're here. <coughs> As a user, I'm facing complex and conflicting requests. That's my concern. Um, I'm constantly being hit with information. How do I deal with it? Everyone's heard of information overload. I couldn't find a decent picture, so I've got this clip art. Sorry, everyone. It's, it's different from how machines deal with things because they follow a linear progression of commands. Um, but we try and respond to everything at the same time. So machines, they can actually carry out a, a whole millions of lines of code to build something and be successful. While humans, frankly, do very odd things. They do not react or behave uh, in the way that things are intended to work. Not by the people who design them anyway. We create our own ways of working and that's a normal behavior. In fact, Everyone here that works for a company will have a standard operating model in your company and I'd be amazed if any of you follow it because 
Not because it's not a good idea, but because it's been designed on a one-person thinking. It doesn't actually fit how you operate, and it probably not embodies your interaction with behaviors that would make your work um, a standard for everyone else. In fact, probably your colleagues don't want to work the way you work. It's normal human behavior that we find ways to bypass these imposed procedural systems just to get things done, to get things done usually better than the procedure says that can be done. So, to address, or to start to address these problems, and let me please underline that we are not saying that we have the answers to this problem. This is early days. Um, all we're doing at the moment is trying to define the problem itself and to find ways to look for to help to put the user in the situation and design for the user within the Internet of Things. And this is very early days. So part of this whole talk is basically just to throw the question out there rather than actually say, we have the answer, here's our manifesto, and this is how you do it. However, uh, last November at um, um, a conference, a user centered design conference in London, uh, probably a user centered design society, um, we did a workshop um, to look at how we can start to design for appropriation in the Internet of Things. And this was done for a large group of UX architects, designers, practitioners, basically. And basically, we worked through a number of scenarios framed by the following issues. We wanted to look at how users can start to control a distributed and often invisible set of systems and how we as designers can help the users build useful mental models of these systems in an ever-changing dynamic <laughs> ecosystem. Um, also to discover what they want and what they need. Also to understand how it will change. Because of course any interaction they do to the system will change the state of the system. How will they know this? How will they start to understand that they, when they make this change, they change the whole system. Also to be able to predict outcomes, things like this. And so what we did was we gave them a set of scenarios, home, in a car, hospital, public space like a mall. Because in my experience of my own research, I found people, when thinking about invisible systems, only start to get it when they place it again by appropriation within their own daily routine. So thinking about what you do at home, helps you think about what this system is like. Okay, so I, I did the data mining on it. There's a lot of information, and uh, hopefully I've been reasonable in my representation of it here. Um, I think there's some sort of three key themes there. One was behavioral. One was about how it might affect me. What's in it for me? How does it affect me? One was uh, about trust and security and the notion of becoming less than human. And the other one was about opportunity, about how this can augment my reality and actually make me a better human. So there's, as I said earlier, we're not doomsayers here. I think there's lots of great opportunities here. We just need to work out how to use them. Um, I think the ones that really jumped out were the distractions. Uh, but then the second one was connections, opportunity. People are very positive about the IoT. But again, it's about how to adopt it. The one that I hadn't really talked about was hacking. Uh, there's major concern about hacking and terrorism. Uh, about lose, if you're going to lose control, who's going to gain control? And something else that came up was, will my house yeah. tell my insurance company about what I do at home? You know, are you going to lose control of, over how you're allowed to behave in your own private space? And will there be any private spaces at any place I can turn off the IoT? And another one that came out was, when I lose the actual skills to be human, as humanity changes, and we will, it's a normal process that we adopt and we change how we live and how we work, will I lose the skills I have now and, and will the next generation be able to understand how to do things or will they be purely the puppets of the IoT? That sounds really neat. But it goes back down to who sets the standards? Is it going to be the brands and the companies who spend billions building products, 
or would it be the people who have to use them who are going to be expected to pay for them that will set the standards? So, we have some ideas. As we said earlier, we're not, we're not the solution providers Absolutely. here, but we do have some ideas based around what we've done so far. And again, this isn't a manifesto, but we thought coming out of this workshop, there are some considerations for people who are designing these systems, these services, these devices, to keep in mind while designing it. I mean, you may have a really exciting idea for a new service or a new um, device to plug into the Internet of Things. You may have even worked out how the user would work with this particular service. But it's not enough anymore to think like that. We've now got to think at a higher level that it's not just the device, but it's how the device interacts with the humans, other humans, and the whole ecosystem. So first off, we need to think, you need to think, what is your device or service actually for? What will it do? And of course, that's your pitch for your service. But then you've got to think, where will it be situated? In what scenarios will it be active? And what will trigger it to start working? Unintentional triggers as well as triggers that you've expected. And more, most importantly, what other devices will it be interacting with? Because here, if you've not considered what other devices and services you might be working with, here's where you could get unexpected consequences or unexpected outcomes when a user or a group of users moves into the situation that these things are situated in. Um, so we're going to think about where can there be clashes that could actually damage or at least make things uncomfortable for the user. And also, as Carl just pointed out, hacking is a major um, issue. And there are already a lot of um, devices on these kinds of things, like um, personal CCTV home systems, which require a level of security. And we've got to remember that quite a lot of users will set these things up but their security will be very weak, the old password or one, two, three. So we've got to design for that. Otherwise, we look at outcomes like, has anyone heard of a uh, search engine called Shodan? Yeah. Shodan is a search engine where you can look for devices and then get things. And it is used by some people to actually access unsecured home CCTV um, cameras. So that's kind of very creepy and very sinister. So we've got to keep these things in mind. Basically, we have to take the design principle that when we're designing, we've got this fantastic thing we want to design, but we've got to also think that this thing must do no harm, either to the humans within the system or the system itself, that it must take responsibility for its own actions. So in all this context, it's critical. You know, there's the, the need to have situational awareness. I mean, in fact, the original uh, thing I put forward, situational awareness was the thing that caused the incident. So we have, there are lots of barriers that reduce our ability to understand the situations around us. So we actually have perception based. Our ability to actually understand what we're seeing, what it means relative to other IoT devices, what it means relative to other real world situations, and also our perceptions may be limited or controlled by our actual context in that minute. I did a huge study for a retail group that were moving everything into the IoT and mobile systems uh, without the basic understanding that their target audience were mainly mothers aged uh, sort of 25 to 35 with children under five. If you've ever tried to look after a child at the age of three while trying to place an order on a mobile device on traveling on public transport, you'll understand why that is not a good way of thinking about it. And actually expecting people to add credit details to a card system is just crazy. So we change the that. So excessive motivation, that's when you're, um, you're totally exclusively thinking about one thing. That leaves you unaware of other potential outcomes. Complacency, hey, I'm safe, I'm in my car. Overload. 
simply silly things going on. You know, and I always had this, this conversation with my wife, she can multitask, I can't. Um, I think what she does, she chops processes. Me, I try and season through to the end. We just have a different way of working. Fatigue. The world isn't getting any slower. We're actually getting more and more things to do. We've already got the information overload. Trying to, I looked up how many social networks I'm on. I'm on just over 60 social networks now, although I don't use them all all the time. But I use the network to try and understand things. I don't necessarily, I'm not the, uh, the person shouting out things, I'm the person listening, trying to understand the relevancy of what's going on around me. And poor communications. You know, I, I was saying to someone recently, search is a terrible term. I want to find. You know, I'm, I'm not interested in, in how the company understands its products or services, because I didn't learn their language at school. I learned a general use of English. I didn't learn I think about a company that won't sue me. I didn't learn any <laughs> IT company's language or any retail company's language. I didn't learn those languages. So actually having the ability to find things is what I'm interested in. So one of the things that we've really thought about here would be a smart use of artificial intelligence. Now, but not the way that we're currently using it, which is a I want to think about it as an inversion. I mean, at the moment, we tend to think of artificial intelligence as a way to find things, uh, that will define what things mean, and will then propagate them. Yeah. Actually, what I need is an artificial intelligence that will learn Carl, that will support Carl in understanding how to use IoT, understand my behaviors, and enable me to touch the points in IoT that I can touch, but also will gracefully fall away once I'm secure in using something. And that, that is a much better way of thinking about it. We've got a short film here um, about someone that's, that's really thought about artificial intelligence. Whether you believe what he's done or not, George Holman, is, is irrelevant. But what his thinking process is, is quite brilliant. And I've just jumped a slide. Instead of trying to map the entire world the way other people are doing, he's tried to teach Carl how to learn how to drive based around someone that's been driving. And that's the kind of interaction I would hope in the IoT, but it's not my decision to make. So after all that, and I can see some of the suffering, pain, and pain ah. when we were going through the science earlier. Yeah. Um, what are we doing here? Um, First off, we're not here to sell consultancy, we're not here to do loads of business deals. We're actually here to engage with you and ask you to engage with us. Yeah. We don't know what the answer is, but we know there is an answer to be found. Yeah. Uh, and what we have done is we have set up a Slack conversation uh, in the aim of creating an open standard. 
you know, we have to participate in this discussion about the future of humanity. If we don't participate, it will be decided without our voices. So um, please yeah. sign up. I'll add you into the Slack uh, and you know, participate, please. We want to hear why we're wrong, if we're wrong. We want to hear what you know that we don't know because we're only a tiny part of the world and the, what's at stake is the whole thing. Thank you very well, much. Well, as the IoT is a dynamic system, so designing for the IoT should be a dynamic system as well. Thank you.